So one of the terms you might hear me use is the Whig version of history. You've actually probably heard that before, so I thought I would take some time and explain that. So the Whig version of history is this idea that things are getting better and better all the time. It's named after the Whig Party, which is a, a political party that emerges in the 18th century. Actually, it starts in the Restoration, but we'll be we'll have plenty of time to talk about that. Um, so I won't go into detail about that right now. But they had the confidence that they were better than the era that was past. So it kind of stuck and that their vision of history, there were a lot of historians in the 18th century, their vision of history was a gradual improvement of the human condition and human society. So people still adhere to this theory and um, you'll hear it used mostly disparagingly. Oh, that's a weak version of history. But I'll, I'll tell you some, um, I'll give you an example of someone who, who is, I think, offers an interesting Whig version of history, and that would be um, Steven Pinker, this book, The Better Angels of Our Nature. Now, I know you probably um, have some negative feelings, possibly about Steven Pinker. He gets a lot of, gets a lot of, um, um, comes under scrutiny quite a bit from other academics, but it's an interesting book because what he argues is that we experience less violence than we did in the past. So I'm not saying you have to agree with that, but that's his argument. And he uses um, data and anthropology and kind of, and argues that even though there've been some like hugely violent events, like World War II, for example, or the US Civil War, that, that actually overall, um, violence each century has decreased per capita. So, so that's a weak version of history. And I think he would actually embrace that. So I actually think that there's something to that. I think that there are things that have actually gotten better and that are better now than they were in the 17th century. I think one, um, might be medicine. I'm, I'm always amazed at how much pain people endured in the restoration in the 18th century. And I'm sure they did before and for years afterwards, but that's just the period I, I know. Uh, Frances Burney, the novelist, for example, underwent a mastectomy. She had um, breast cancer and no anesthesia, you know, just basically whiskey. And so that would have led to a lot of pain. So I think you know, we don't really experience that, um, necessarily have that pain associated with medical operations. So there have been some definitely good things about modernity that's made um, humans a little happier. Um, so another one you might say is transportation. It took a really long time to get from one place to the other. You'd go in a horse or, or a carriage and it would just take it would just take a long time so you never really a lot of people didn't really um go very far outside of their um small area so um so if you think about that though this kind of massive um progress in transportation has led to some really bad effects too, like climate change. I mean, obviously I'm simplifying this for effect, but those are the limits of the weak version of history is that you look at one thing that's improved, but then you don't always look at the other things that are, that are bad, um, that have actually been unintended consequences and sometimes, sometimes intended consequences. So another, so, People think about, I, I find anyway, that there's a popular weak version of history around social justice issues. And so I'll take an example of um, women's rights. I find um, in teaching the 18th century for many, many years, maybe 30 years, students always assume that, um, oh, it must have been so hard to be a woman in the 18th century. It's so much better now. We're so much more liberated. Um, so, and, and I always think, well, 
you know, yes and no. I mean, some things are better, some things aren't aren't, aren't so much better. Uh, for example, in the 17th century, um, in a agricultural family in rural England, women had a very important economic function in the um, in the family, and so uh, basically the women took care of the dairy, and um, and so because every single person in that family was really important, and also because uh, the w woman's uh, overseeing of the dairy was absolutely crucial to the functioning of the farm, you know, there's a sense in which women were, um, women, certain women had a kind of authority. And then you'd say, well, what about working class women? Well, um, yeah, they were definitely had a very difficult life, but I'm not sure, like, is it, is that because they were women or because they were in in the laboring class? And what about them compared to 17th century laboring class males? Would you see that disparity? Whereas when you get to the 18th century, there emerges the system that we're familiar with where women are responsible for a domestic space and a husband might go out and, and work in the world. So, so there's one case in which um, you can't really draw a straight line from um, from a sort of benighted past to an enlightened present, and I would say that's like the heart of the intellectual version of the weave version of history, is that nobody thought of these things then, and and we think of them now. Um, another another version is. Just to take an example, sexuality. There's kind of an assumption, and certainly if you're teaching, I'm sure you've run into this with your students too, that um, that people were very repressed in the past. And so, but if you but if you look at, in the 17th century, for example, in elite culture, you'll see that there was a pretty widespread acceptance of men having mistresses sometimes of women having lovers in some instances, and also of same-sex relationships that were, you know, kind of accepted. On the other hand, um, sodomy was illegal and it was a um, capital offense. On the third hand, that's three hands there, um, very few people were actually put to death for sodomy. And often when they were, it was because there was something else going on. So. So the answer is, it's complicated. So whenever you start thinking about, um, we're so much more enlightened now than folks were in the 17th century and the 18th century, um, ask yourself, am I constructing a weak version of history? And is that the version of history that I actually believe in? And might there be another way of thinking about this?